Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to two out of three of a series of collaborative webinars between Nautel and our friends at the TELUS Alliance. I'm your host, Jeff Welton, and we're going to be covering several things today. First and foremost, the housekeeping items. If you've never watched one of our webinars before, there is in the control panel a place where you can enter your questions. By all means, do that. We're going to be pushing hard on the clock today, so I may not get to all of them. We will whenever we can. If we can't, we'll answer them by email after the fact, but absolutely feel free to ask them. You know, um, these things are, are only possible with uh, feedback from folks like you, so we're just happy you're willing to spend some time with us. We're looking forward to having some fun. If you're an SBE member, don't forget that uh, today's webinar does qualify for half of a recertification credit under Schedule I in the SBE research uh, program. So by all means, don't forget to do that as well. We've got a, uh, a huge cast of characters today, if you will, some, uh, some stellar guests and good friends. Of course, myself, we've got uh, Jeff Stedman, the uh, Omnia product manager for the TELUS Alliance. We've got... Uh, our own uh, Philip Schmidt, who is our chief technical officer, and uh, again one of the one of the greatest minds I know, and uh, John White will be herding the cats as our director of marketing and uh, the guy that uh, keeps the trains running on time back at the factory. So on that note, let's uh, roll right into it. We want to talk about the uh, about the um, basic agenda today. We'll uh, talk about the uh, collaboration between Nautel and the TELUS Alliance, some of the challenges that we're seeing historically with, uh, with uh, radio and getting the audio from over here to over there, and uh, do a demonstration on what we've done to uh, look after all that. Now, with that, I want to hand it over to John White, and uh, John can lead into the event. Thank you, John. That's great. Thanks, Jeff. And Thanks for all of you that are joined in today and spending part of your busy day with us, uh, Nautel and the TELUS Alliance. And I expect you want to get to the meat of today's presentation. So I'm just going to take a moment to explain why Nautel and TELUS Alliance are excited and very excited to be working together um, and hopefully contributing uh, to our industry, why we're working together and why now. And so first of all, our two companies share a common passion for broadcasting innovations. Uh, TELUS Alliance, with its long history of innovation in digital audio processing, audio over IP, Nautel, with its contributions to transmitter design, our work to make digital radio easier and less costly, control to manage all that advanced technology. And we've actually worked very well together in the past as well. We have a history of working together on things like micro MPX. So we're mixing all that passion and innovation heritage together with what we observe in the industry and what we're hearing that you're seeing that's going on in the industry. Change, new challenges. Uh, it seems if I look back in the springtime that overnight most of our operations went remote and that came on the backs of the change to the main studio ruling that many were digesting. So at the same time we're seeing significant new technolo technological approaches, virtualization, uh, software implementations of technologies that were historically embedded in hardware, the cloud. So all of this creates a rare conversion of challenges and technology that seems to occur to me about every 10 to 15 years. And we believe that one of those windows is open right now for fresh opportunities for your challenges. So that's what we're hoping to provide is new approaches. And we'll show you a bit of that in a few moments. That's why we're collaborating. Uh, there's another point that I want to speak to, though, as well. And if we can flip to the next slide, please. Digital radio. And wh whether you've been a proponent for HD radio or not, we kind of see it as still a tool that's going to be in our toolkit going forward. If we could just make it crazy dumb, easy to implement, and cheap. And that's one of the things we're going to tackle early on in this collaboration is how can we make digital radio be a tool for you um, to help you compete for listening ears and against some of the challenges that you're facing. So with that, I'm going to hand it over. We're going to take a look at one of these new fresh approaches today. I'll hand it back to you, Jeff, and we can move on with the rest of the presentation. Thank you. 
Well, thanks very much, John. And uh, yeah, there's just been a whole lot of really exciting things. I'm not going to waste a whole lot of your time because you really want to talk to the guys that know what they're talking about. Today, that's not me. So I am going to hand it straight over to Philip Schmidt to talk about some of these challenges. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you know, last time we did a review of the uh, radio air chain, including HD radio. Today, we're going to focus on what has become probably one of the, the chief uh, challenges with HD radio, and that is the uh, maintaining the diversity delay, the, uh, the blending experience from FM to HD. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, this quote from Alan Gerson, an excellent article in Radio World that I would like you to certainly recommend to read. Uh, it has become the audible artifacts in the blending has become one of the top complaints from audio manufacturers and consumers alike. Um, and while there are some solutions in the market today, we're, we're showing you a fresh approach, a fresh solution as to how we can uh, manage that and that will lead into new opportunities. So let's get started. A little bit of a recap from last week. Uh, we've established last week, or two weeks ago, I should say, uh, that you know, HD radio certainly added a lot of complexity and cost. Um, you know, initially all the exporter importer equipment was recommended to be back at the studio to minimize uh, STL bandwidth, uh, but that required a second STL, oftentimes a second transmitter even. So that certainly complicated a lot of things. And what initially, uh, you know, wasn't such a big deal as we had very few receivers in the field, but as more and more receivers came on on the market, it 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 showed that maintaining the FM and HD audio delay so that the, the blend between FM and HD is perfectly aligned uh, become, is very challenging in this sort of architecture because you're trying to steer two separate audio paths over very long distances. It's kind of like driving your car from the back seat. Um, you know, it, it, it's possible but hard. And our target here is three audio samples. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the next couple of slides. So first of all, let's dive down a little bit deeper from last time. Well, why does HD have delay built in? Um, so I think we'd like to answer that question first. And the iBoc Handbook has a very good example that I'd like to show you here. And uh, it's, it's all to do with the interleaving of the data that's being transferred. Assume you want to transfer the message, bytes are split in time, uh, in, in order across a, a noisy channel. And if there is, you know, periodic interference, um, then uh, every now and then you can, uh, it will wipe out a fairly large portion of the message. So if you devise a, a scheme that interleaves or scrambles uh, the, the original message into a different order, and if the receiver knows how to reorder it, then, uh, you know, the, this, the same um, interruption in time is now spread over time. And, you know, that way, the forward air correction that's built into the system can make up the intermittent bit errors. And it's the same, it's you know, conceptually the same as even your mind reading the last message now. Even though there's letters missing, you can make out the message bytes are split in time. Um, whereas the original one, you weren't quite sure what that word might have been. Um, now all of this takes time. Uh, you know, the interleaver is, is working on L1 frame boundaries of 1.48 seconds. But first, you have to receive that, uh, scramble it, transmit it, unscramble on the other side. So there is four and a half seconds just doing this operation. Then certainly there's other delay buffers and delays uh, in, inside the air chain that then brings the typical HD delay to eight to 10 seconds, depending on the equipment and installation. So this is why the HD is delayed. So in order for the uh, FM to be aligned in time, of course, we're all familiar with the fact that we have to delay uh, the FM. And that's what we call the diversity delay. But let's look at a little bit more at this example here to explain how that, that all works together as a fallback uh, method to, to the FM or to, to the HD to the FM. So in this, uh, depiction here, and it probably requires a little bit of explanation. On the left, you have one common studio feed, whatever your modulation would be, uh, then a very simplified transmitter box, which includes your transmitter, importer, exporter, all the equipment. Um, so that's all the transmission site. Uh, in the middle is sort of the over the air channel, and every now and then you'll see a red blip like that, where it will wipe out both the FM and the HD. Um, and um, one second here, there we go. Uh, it will wipe out both the FM and the HD. So part, part of the delay 
since we already established the HD has this four and a half second delay, that has to be compensated with the FM on the transmitter side. Uh, but part of the delay is on the receive side. What the effect of that is, whenever you have that interruption and you can see that that blend function in the middle, uh, when it loses HD lock, and that only happens if the impairment is big enough, um, you know, in the mid and bit errors, it, it, the four error correction handles, but when the impairment is severe, it will fall back to the FM. However, because of the delay, the FM delays back in the transmitter and the receiver has its own delay, when the interruption is done and blends to FM, the FM should no longer be impaired. That's, that's the theory, if it's all aligned well. Now, let's have a look and see if the system is not perfectly set up. First of all, what happens if your audio levels are uh, not the same? And uh, no big surprise here, if we're blending to the FM, then of course you'll have a change in audio level. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that makes sense. Our goal is to stay within about half a dB of audio loudness. So you first set up your FM processor to be within your modulation requirements. Then you have to match your HD1 levels, either in the audio processor or some of the uh, configurations in the uh, exporter chain, uh, so that they are about the same. Now, typically, once you have found your, your levels, uh, they don't, I mean, the content does affect it, yes, uh, but overall, it's, it's, a, it's almost a set and forget setting. It's, it doesn't, it's not something you have to keep a close eye on. It. The bigger problem is, of course, when we get into the time alignment errors. So, in the same situation again, uh, but this time we have an offset in time that there, there's a difference in phasing between the FM and the HD audio. Uh, and certainly, when we blend back the FM and the HD and the alignments are big, you know, say 40, uh, 50 milliseconds or more, you know, it can be entirely repeated words or, or drop skipped words, depending on which way the, the error goes, or it could be repeat, repeated or skipped content. And, you know, those we can iron out by ear. You know, we can certainly walk in the delay close enough. Uh, but even small misalignments can cause audible audio artifacts. Um, and that's, you can see that with the phasing difference in here that kind of makes that visual uh, that, you know, it is not the same audio as it's blending from the FM to the HD. So the question is, how close do we need to be aligned? So I've set up uh, a little bit of a, a simulation here, and uh, essentially what happens as both audio components between the FM and the HD are present uh, on your speaker, um, you know, as the HD rolls off and the FM comes on, both audio parts will be present for a split period of time. During that transition, essentially what you have is an audio filtering effect. Um, and if, you know, if the audio is identical, well, no issue there. If they're perfect, then we have no problem. Uh, however, if there's even a three audio sample uh, delay, as you know, as per NRC five specification, what you'll see in the middle of that blend, where both audio signals have the same volume, you'll get the the, the steepest filtering effect. And at three audio samples, it will affect your high end audio, seven kilohertz or more. Well, that's still not that big of a deal if most of our audio content is between one and four or five kilohertz. Not that big a deal. It's only a split second. Uh, so that's still very, very good. But what happens if we go out further? Well, um, let's say we slip by 12 to 50 samples. And again, we're talking microseconds here. Uh, 68 microseconds in the first one. Now we're going up to 272 or a millisecond, uh, that ballpark you'll see there's more and more comb effects happening across the audio. And at 12, we're starting to affect 1.8 kilohertz. We're you know, pretty close to some of our key audio. And all of the notches are still fairly wide. So a very large portion of your audio aura is affected. Uh, but as we, uh, as we slip out more, you get more and more comb filter effects, but they become more and more selective. So the interesting thing that happens is that as you get out further, let's say 6.8 milliseconds, 300 samples here, you get a lot of notches, but are getting very, very selective, meaning that the likelihood that your audio content falls exactly into those little spikes is very unlikely. Uh, so therefore, the blend actually gets better again. So we have this uh, strange artifact where, it, you know, we can shoot for the bullseye of three audio samples, but then we have a, uh, a challenging area, and then it gets better again. 
my recommendation is if you cannot guarantee to hit the bullseye, and uh, in the next slide, we'll see some typical diversity delay measurements as uh, found by the NRC um, uh, G203 uh, working group. Um, and uh, if you cannot guarantee to fall within our bullseye, you may be better off just simply being off by a few milliseconds. But our goal is to get to the three samples. That really is the, our, our golden um, target that we want to get to. Um, so here in this picture, you see on the left-hand side is um, uh, you know, a system that's, that's running across an SDL with the exporter on one side, the uh, exciter on the other side. And you know, it's swinging by 200 samples, uh, you know, four to five milliseconds. Um, that's what it's swinging by. And even if you iron out the average delay, the delay you're, still not, you're still going to go through these transition areas all the time. Now, if you plug in a 10 megahertz GPS-based uh, clock uh, to synchronize your exciter, you know, it gets better, but it's still a very, very tough window to meet. Um, so again, we haven't quite achieved the three samples. So the NRSC has uh, spent quite a bit of time and effort uh, analyzing the problem, and they created a very comprehensive and very worthwhile reading report uh, that uh, certainly if, if you're setting up uh, HD installations, this is certainly a, a must read. Uh, lots of good information in here. Uh, not always the easiest read, but uh, uh, certainly worthwhile. Uh, and in that, uh, one of the recommendations really is well, if you put everything at a transmitter site, um, then it is easier to maintain uh, the, the different audio paths and maintain any differences in audio delay. Uh, so that was one of their, their key recommendations. Another one is that you really want to have a single audio processor, a single dual output audio processor that can handle both the FM and the HD so that you know the blend transition, you've got you know, the best possible audio phasing and the best possible audio aura uh, to make them all sound the same, it is much different to maintain, harder to maintain delay and blend experience with two separate processors. So that's the other recommendation. Now, even in this setup here, like we've shown before as well, it is difficult to maintain those tight uh, delay corrections. So we, several uh, companies, uh, there are several products on the market that uh, essentially receive your on-air signal, uh, the FM signal, both the FM and the HD. Uh, they will run a correlator to figure out what the uh, differential delay is. They will either uh, report what the error is or even control a uh, built-in or an external delay line to uh, keep the delay in, in check. Uh, so we call this a reactive delay correction um, because it, it has to react to whatever the signal is on air. It's a feedback loop. Uh, so one of the challenges with that is that it can hide underlying delay drifts. Uh, you know, it, 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 they work quite well, but they will fix underlying systemic problems. Uh, the other challenge with it, of course, as well is, and is that you have to be able to receive your signal, so you're limited to your station coverage in order to, to figure that the delay as well. Um, and you know, while the corrector is running its feedback loop, it has to adjust either your HD or your FM audio, and that has an impact on the audio itself. The best thing is really, can we fix the delay overall? So uh, last time we've already introduced our two key technologies that, we're, that we think will be part of this the solution. Um, first of all, we're looking again at the exporter to XGen link, E2X. If, you know, if you've been around HD radio, you would have heard those terms mentioned before. And uh, it, uh, it is a protocol defined by Xperi or Ubiquity originally. Um, and uh, it conveys all the HD radio content as transmitted uh, by the XGen modulator. But it, it does not convey the FM content. But it's designed for an IP SDL with low bandwidth, and it's really a de facto standard uh, that, that's used in the industry. Um, and you know, it goes back to 2005, 2006. Um, so most, and, and you know, Natal has done quite a bit of uh, cross compatibility studies and it, it works quite well. The other part uh, also made for radio standard is, you know, we, we want to look at MPX over IP. Conceptually, the two are very identical in that they multiplex all the components of the signal together and transmit it over a single stream. So those are very parallel 
uh, protocols, and I th that's what makes them fit quite nicely together. Uh, we've already spoken about that quite a bit last time, and uh, Jeff Sedman has done a great uh, overview of that. So we left it off last time with how can we centralize the entire radio air chain? Uh, you know, we've asked the question, can we move things back? Can we be location agnostic? Uh, and how can we use these major radio standards and technologies? Well, um, our answer today is, well, we're, we're, we're proposing a new approach. Uh, we're showing you today a soft, an entirely software-based HD radio server. No more hardware requirements, uh, no more GPS, no more uh, reactive uh, off-air receiver, no more audio cards. Uh, we can show you an entirely software-based approach. And one of the key uh, parts of that that we already showed you last time is we've partnered with TELUS Alliance uh, to uh, um, have a closer look at the Omnia Enterprise 9S for software audio processing. And uh, Jeff will give us a little bit more of a, uh, a deep dive after the next slide and show you some of the features here. But before we do that, I'll show you what we've done and what we've come up with to uh, combine these things. So we've looked at the uh, Omnia 9S uh, and realized that uh, it is running at the correct sample rates that HD is running at. And with that, we uh, came up with this concept where can we devise a synchronous system all the way from where the audio splits in the audio processor, and that is the ideal place for the split, all the way through to the join. So we want to avoid asynchronous sample rate converters. Uh, we want to avoid any sort of um, external components that, that can add, add slip to it. And the third aspect of it is we came up with um, a combined E2X and MPX protocol across a single pipe. Now we're using TCP IP here as uh, our current example, but we could certainly look at different profiles. You know, UDP could work, um, but the key really is it's a single E2X interleaved with MPX transmission stream. And in doing so, uh, Nautel is able to create a modulator that does both the FM modulation. Now in this case, it doesn't do any stereo generation. That's all done back at, in the Omnia 9S. Uh, but it does the interpolation to the proper rates. Uh, it does the FM modulation and, and it combines it with the XGen HD modulator. And that's where the two signals join again. So we've created this entire signal here. And just a few key points I want to highlight here is the reason why this works is because we have three components, a synchronous audio processor, a combined transmission scheme, and a synchronous modulator. So those are the three components that need to come together to make this happen. And everything is rate locked. So our HD1 is 44.1 kilohertz audio left to right. And the MPX is an exact four times multiple of that. So it, it fits, you know, the ratios fit. It's nicely ratio locked. And that's what keeps all this stuff together. So at this point, I'd like to uh, uh, pass it over to Jeff uh, Stedman. And uh, he will give us a little bit more of a, uh, some feature highlights as to uh, what the Omnia 9 has to offer for the system. Thank you, Philip. Um, uh, great windup for this. and, and uh, I think uh, my part of the talk is really to, to do sort of a, a little side chain into the uh, some particulars about the Omnia 9 uh, S. Um, probably the best thing I can say is that uh, for many of you know the Omnia 9, many of you are users of it as a uh, as a hardware box. And what we've done in the in our enterprise offerings, and this is really in software, and the 9S is that um, that iteration of the Omnia 9 hardware, but in, as a, a, a software embodiment, uh, it shares um, its DNA with the box that so many use and uh, and love. And for those who don't know. What's special about the uh, the Omnia 9? I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an overview. Um, it's very feature-rich, uh, versatile processor, uh, two to seven band uh, processing, completely configurable based on what your output is and and what your your preferences are. Um, 
it, the processor is um, quite adept at for FM, HD, DAB, streaming, and it's a killer, even as an AM processor, it's a, it's a, a killer sounding AM. Uh, some of the things that it uh, features it has that uh, are are unlike any other, undo is probably the first and foremost, which is um, uh, declipping combined with downward expansion. And this is really to fix so much of the, the crud that um, comes from most, a lot of modern masters where they've just smashed uh, the, the dynamic range of, of music to the point where, well, they're trying to make it sound like it's on, on the radio, but then you get into this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, head bumping where there's no life left because there's no dynamic range. And undo is something that can restore that uh, for broadcast. Uh, it's got embedded pilot for uh, one louder signal, uh, advanced RDS. Um, it's got an in, its own internal playout system for, for failover in case all your sources are lost. Um, and uh, advanced uh, signal analytics and uh, very flexible monitoring. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and uh, this is uh, the, the, the monitoring capabilities and the analytic capabilities of the Niner are um, unrivaled. Uh, you can set up, and, and you can see in this window, I've set up six different um, meters. You could set up to eight. You could put this on a 60 inch monitor and have uh, just the, the, a complete picture of virtually any point in the air chain or the, the process. You can also, what, what you can see and, um, and, and visually look at, you can also patch in and monitor. So if you wanted to listen to a single point within a processing, internal to a processing chain, you can achieve that with the nine. So for those who are um, sort of the superheroes of the processing world, uh, this is your this is your tool. Uh, meanwhile, for those who are, are um, who, who just want to set and forget uh, our processing um, presets, are, uh, are 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 quite unparalleled and and very comprehensive. Um, all of this is. Um, brought to you by the NF remote application. It's an application that is, if, you've, if you have a nine operating the, the nine S would be exactly the same. It'd be the same screens, the same look, the same feel. And for the most part, um, the same feature set. There are some hardware features that aren't, uh, are, are sort of irrelevant once we go into this, this virtual world that we find ourselves in. But uh, that's the, the, the sort of uh, uh, mainstay of, the, of what I call sonic visibility that uh, NF Remote affords you. So on to the, the next. Um, one of the things we really pride ourselves on is the cohesion between the, the HD1 and the FM signal. And that is, uh, you know, as, as the, the, the NAB uh, uh, paper that uh, recommendation that Philip cited, um, you really want this to be the same in the same processor. But not just that, you want these um, pieces of the processor chain to be common up to the point where they have to depart and be, because uh, obviously with an MPX FM output, you're, um, you're doing a final limiting stage, you're doing clipping that you don't do on the HD output. But as much as possible, you want these to be common. So when you do get that blend, uh, it's it's the same sonic signature, and the the Omni Nine uh, S excels at this. Um, right. And uh, Jeff, if I may, may interject, uh, when we first looked at the Omni Enterprise Nine S as a solution for this, we took a very careful look at how stable the delay out of this processor is, and uh, so we've embedded the Nine S sort of within actually I've embedded it within a MATLAB environment. And we verified that this cohesion that you're talking about is, is true. Uh, we, we've let it run for a very long time. There's no slip. It is all a very synchronous system, and we were impressed with that. Thanks, Philip. And, and, and now with this, this innovation, um, the, we, we've got the, the, the drift. Uh, we, we've, we've tamed the conditions where that drifting can happen at all and sort of taken that off the table. And that's, um, 
that's really, uh, 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 I think, huge. Um, just on the, the, the next uh, slide, if you will, uh, one of the other things I think is, is worth mentioning to those who may not be familiar, and we're, we're really looking to the 9S as we can virtualize our processing and have it be in more places. Uh, in terms of preset development, we find a lot of um, our, our customers and clients who spend years perfecting that one signature sound. And they want to use this in as many places as possible. And uh, with this approach, you literally can take a preset that you've built for, say, your FM and just cut and paste it for your streaming for HD 2, 3, 4. Uh, if you've developed something for, say, for talk and it's you think it's it's perfect, when you move that into the, um, the, the channel, if you will, for that type of broadcast that you're doing, whether it's HD or FM, uh, the sonic characteristics carry over. So this takes this this really allows you to to um, leverage all the effort that you put into creating a special sound and move it around your plant, share it with your uh, sister station or within your group, uh, and use it across streams. Uh, use it on different, uh, you know, whether whether FM or HD. Or, or DAB, and this is a, um, a, a great, um, I'd say, point in terms of uh, a reason that you want to have more denser uh, uh, processing solutions because you can leverage all the work that you've done to get to that that uh, great uh, sonic point. Um, next, please. So. One of the things that's um, that's obviously at the heart of why we're able to move our processing into a more virtual world is that we've got IP coming in and IP going out, and we're we're uh, able to get use nodes or our uh, um, other devices that are on ramps and off ramps, our endpoints. Uh, but once we get everything into IP, we can start to um, really leverage. And, and as you see in this demonstration, we're putting the Omnia 9S into uh, a, a Nautel context. And this is all sort of brought to you by uh, IP. Uh, one of the things that's, that's key to what we're doing with Nautel is we're actually delivering that MPX uh, over IP, this is this is a, a full linear um, uh, uh, signal, um, and that's what we're delivering on top of uh, what's a 44.1 left-right uh, signal, and that's that's been a, a, a major driver in innovation that's uh, that's helped us in this this endeavor. And uh, just for a recap, our next uh, it, oh, I should I should also mention just in terms of. Uh, uh, streams it, it, for for a high density solution uh, because the 9s also supports uh, multiple streaming outputs whether you're you're pushing to a icecast or a shoutcast server we're we're, um, we're supporting sort of a major um, stream codecs uh, of the day AAC HEAAC uh, -E and MP2 3 and FLAC uh, next uh, so just as a recap, and this is sort of uh, recapping what we, where we were a couple weeks ago, um, some of the, the highlights, the ability to, to have multiple instances and a high density solution on a single server, um, the ability to host the server on-prem or off-prem, um, our ability to integrate processing within other workflows, and this is a huge case in point with, uh, with Nautel. The scalability of the solution, um, we really see this as uh, as the future of processing and where, where uh, the TELUS Alliance plans to take it. And uh, it's all about leveraging expanding IP infrastructures and working with great partners. And uh, all of this enabled by standards-based 
IP audio. Um, really excited to be working with Nottel on this. And um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's just fitting that uh, we're, we're really looking at taming this, this whole uh, drift, but that's just the beginning of, I think, the, the, uh, the promise of, of this kind of integration. So Philip, why don't I pass it back to you and uh, before you do that, I am going to take over the microphone for just a second. We got one or two questions that very specifically apply to Mr. Stedman. Um, you'd mentioned in the summary that uh, you can run multiple instances on a single server. And Marco Aridi has specifically asked if we could run two instances, one to feed an AM station and one to feed an FM. Um, I, you know, we're already doing that on the hardware version, yes. So there's no real reason why you couldn't. No and uh, that that leads into what Will Payne had asked. What's the uh, the primary difference between the 9 and the 9S? Hardware versus software, yeah? Um, yeah, pretty much. One's, one's, a, one's a box and one's a, a software process. And there's a lot of commonality between them. But uh, um, obviously with the, with, uh, the, the 9S um, version, uh, you need IP to get in and out of it. But uh, there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Of you know whether your your input now becomes an X node, for example. Um, there you are. Excellent, thanks. And uh, on that note, now back over to you, Phil. Great. So finally, we're getting to the demonstration we're trying to show you today. So it it it, it deserves a little bit of explanation uh, with all the things we've given you today. So here is the uh, the big picture, literally. Um, so on the right hand side here at uh, Nautel headquarters, we've set up a Nautel VSHD uh, with uh, about 80 watts of signal output. And uh, you know this, uh, this signal is being fed into a dummy load, of course, and uh, we hooked up uh, Innovonics, Sophia and Justin receivers. The Sophia streaming receiver will give us the artist experience, the station logos, and allows us to listen to HD 1, 2, 3, and 4 whereas the Justin 808 gives us the uh, time alignment. So we can uh, get a live read as to how closely we're aligned and uh, whether it's slipping over time. And, uh, but you know, the in interesting thing now is more on the left-hand side. So this is the software HD radio server that we've been talking about, where we combined the uh, Omnia Enterprise 9S with uh, the Gen 4 importer exporter software. And uh, Nautel has put all the plumbing together to get those two together and have all the processing cores that uh, Jeff talked to feed directly into the audio clients. Now, all of this stuff is running in St. Cloud, Minnesota in Alex Hartman's garage. And he is certainly on uh, on this webinar. I'm not sure if he can uh, speak up and speak, but uh, uh, a shout yes, out. I can. Hi. We can. Uh, a big uh, thank you and shout out for getting this set up. And uh, this is about 1,470 miles uh, away from uh, Nautel headquarters, certainly out of the coverage of our 80 watt dummy load signal. Uh, so certainly uh, Alex cannot hear, cannot pick up that signal in his garage. Um, or in internet speak, we're about 39 millisecond ping turnaround time. Uh, so all of these, all the signal we're talking about here is being delivered over to the public internet. Uh, through TCP IP in our case, and we patch both the E2X and the linear uh, MPX through a firewall into our test setup. Um, now, one thing to note here is, you know, this demonstration would not be possible with a purpose-built combined importer exporter with off-air reception because, well, uh, that box could not receive the signal to correct it. So that's certainly a case in point as to uh, where we're going with this. So what I'm hoping to show you today is uh, those various screens will show you the uh, NF remote application, um, the, uh, the Gen 4 importer web UI, our UI, and the receivers, and we'll go from there. However, um, rather than looking at screens here, let's pull up first the NF remote. Um, so over here, you, you see the um, it's creating the MPX signal um, on the right hand side. You see left plus right, the pilot, left minus right, and we also turn on RDS. So that is the NF remote application that Jeff talked about with all the um, uh, sonic uh, visualizations. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail there because we could spend quite a bit of time on that topic alone. 
Uh, but it's running right here. And you can see we have the FM output with 75 microsecond preemphasis. Uh, we have the HD output. And we, we can adjust the output levels of that to match uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the diversity, the, the level alignment. Uh, so that's, that's one way that we can approach that. Uh, one thing I want to just highlight here is, you know, it reports the client CPU usage up here, which is running rather high uh, because of the web, the, the, the go-to meeting uh, software that's screen scraping the screen. And it's, you know, it's taking quite a bit of time to, to all this visual, so, uh, sonic visualization is taking quite a bit of time in the go-to meeting. Normally that sits between 10 and 20%. Um, but just to, uh, to uh, you know, point that out, that is not uh, typical. So all of this signal is now being fed into the uh, Gen 4 importer exporter. And let me see if I can bring that up. Uh, and here we go. I hope you can see that all right. Uh, so if you're familiar with, uh, you know, the fourth generation system, uh, that is the typical web application. And I should highlight both of these systems are directly connecting to Alex Hartman's system. Uh, so it is running, it, it's connecting, they're, they're lo I locally bringing them up on my system. They connect over the internet to uh, St. Cloud and uh, you, you'll see all that. So you're familiar with the traffic lights here, that's all fine and good. Um, the other thing that we want to highlight is um, the thing that we've added here, and hopefully you can see it okay. We've added this new audio input device, uh, the Omni 9 HD1 and MPX. That is a direct connection to the Omni 9. It is not going through any Windows sound interfaces or ALSA or anything like that. It's a direct API to API call. So we're transferring samples un unchanged, unaltered, unsample rate converted. It is raw samples and PCM in, PCM out. So the pipe is as pristine as it could be. And we also have HD2, 3, and 4 set up. Um, and all of those just use the standard um, audio clients uh, delivered with, um, with the uh, fourth generation software. All of this uh, goes into our VSHD. Uh, and I just want to highlight that you know, this is uh, ex an experimental system. So right now, we, we do not have the FM modulation meter uh, populated in this operating mode. Uh, that's coming. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly I just want to highlight that we have our spectrum and uh, all both the FM and the HD are all being sourced for, from SyncCloud, uh, all of it. And we'll, we'll, we'll do a couple demos in a little bit uh, as to how um, we can affect the signal. All of that goes into first our Sophia streaming receiver. You can see we've set up a couple of uh, station logos um, and uh, HD 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you can see they're getting received every so often. We put a little PSD in there. I mean, that's all standard HD uh, feature set. The other thing that we have here as well is if the, in, in, the RDS carrier that you see on the right-hand side. Well, that's what is feeding this right here. So it's the Omni 9 internal RDS encoder. And we, we've populated it with a couple of things. So all of that is coming from the Omni 9. Uh, and here is our diversity delay, uh, the Justin 808, a uh, great product that uh, reliably measures the FMHD1 uh, uh, delay. Um, and uh, we've got it running here on a 10, sec a 10 minute scale. And you can see uh, we've got zero sample delay. Every now and then you will see an instantaneous deviation of one sample and that's measurement error. That's to be expected. And I think that's, you know, that's perfectly fine. The, the actual delay between the two signals will likely be in the subsample range, so it, it, it has a resolution of plus minus one. Um, so all of that is, is you know to be expected. And again, if you remember the, the presentation a few slides back, normally you would see swings of dozens of samples even in with GPS locking, uh, and that is simply not the case here. So the demonstration we want to show you here on in the MPX tab and under stereo generator. Uh, the uh, Omnia 9 has an output delay, and if you double click on that, you can get the controls. So that is the remaining delay that we have to put onto the MPX signal so that uh, it aligns with the HD. But this number has now turned into a fire and forget number. It's, it's always the same number. Now we see a plus minus one sample difference depending on when you start up, 
but again, that is orders of magnitudes better than uh, we have seen in any of the other systems thus far. So that is, is, is very good. Um, so now I can show you, if you click the find delay, that gives me one sample with every click. And let's say I'll dial in five clicks. And let's click on here so we get a, a, a faster update rate. So here we go. And you can see now we have misaligned the audio signal to five samples. Follows it quite nicely. And of course, we can get back to zero. One, two, three, four, five. Here we go. We're walking our way back. Uh, and certainly, you know, you can always dial in a bigger delay just for, for giggles. Let's say 25 milliseconds at a time. So we should have about a 75 millisecond jump now. There we go. So now we've got a bigger staircase. Let's dial it back down. Here we go, and we're perfectly aligned. And again, the important thing to note here is even across system restarts, you bring the system up and down, you reconnect. Um, anything you do, it comes back to this 57, 14, 56, or 53 number. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight here is we've got our levels pretty well matched. Um, you know, and, and there will always be a little bit of residual difference because the HD and the FM are not exactly the same. Uh, you know, there's codecs and, uh, and various differences there as well, but uh, they are very closely matched to within our requirements. All that is fine. And perhaps to show one more thing, um, go back to our AUI. You know, just to show you that it is the audio that, are, that comes in here, we can go into our processing settings and we can bypass the audio processor. It does take a little bit of time to go through, but essentially now we've turned down the volume quite drastically. Uh, and you should see that uh, to uh, show up in our spectrum here. And all that's left are both the uh, RDS and uh, stereo carriers. So you can see we're, we're directly affecting the audio in our signal chain and our in our radio air chain. But let's turn that back on. And here we go. So our audio is back nice and loud. Uh, and uh, in a second or two, we should be back, back up and running. Yeah, so all of this here is working fairly well. You uh, we can also see that we've got very clean signal constellation um, as expected for the HD radio system. So uh, that pretty much concludes the demo. There's certainly a lot more things we could show, um, you know, and, and, and perhaps, you know, as some of the questions come up, we can always uh, schedule a one-on-one -on -one with uh, particular parties if, if necessary, uh, if interested. Um, and uh, well, we were certainly interested in uh, hearing your feedback on all of that. So uh, let's go back to our presentation here. So we've seen all of these slides. This is where I butt in with the questions. Yeah, uh, sure. if you. <laughs> so uh, Sam Wallington had asked if we were using this over uh, open internet and, or uh, VPN, and I did tell him it was open internet and that you guys ignored all of my IT security webinars. Um, but there, but there is no reason why, with the uh, amount of CPU power in the HD multicast, that you couldn't install a VPN client and run a VPN through it as well. Correct? Yeah. No. No. Absolutely. Uh, you know, certainly standard IT practices uh, can be applied here as well. Not only security, but also reliability. Now that we're going back to um, more of a standard software-based approach, um, we can apply standard IT policies or IT techniques to get 100% reliability. Um, right, right. So, and some actual security instead of the whole open internet thing with uh, default usernames, right. et cetera, and so on that, uh, yeah, like I said, ignored everything I've ever taught. Um, right. One other well, thing. Kind of here, going, oh, just Jeff, I want to just throw in there that we are adding a authentication into it. It's not in our demo right now, but we're, we're thinking about adding a private public key authentication so that even if you run across a public internet, uh, you, you will have a secure connection. Good, now, good. Now, we don't believe you need to encrypt it. All Everything that's going across here will be publicly broadcast in eight seconds anyway, uh, but you do want to make sure that there is authentication. 
good. Uh, one other question or one other comment was uh, how do the uh, analog and uh, HD audio levels reference? Uh, they're, they're within half a dB or so? Yes, right. Yeah, you can see it even on on our screen right now. Uh, the uh, uh, Justin 808 does give us a, uh, an audio level uh, m measurement. Uh, and uh, yeah, certainly you want to adjust the drives. First, adjust your FM to be within your 100% modulation uh, or whatever your, your limits are. Um, and then you would fine tune the um, uh, the HD to match. Okay, Mike Modney's asked if the E2X connection is severed, could you set it up to fail over to a different source? That might almost be a question for the next webinar because I know where we're going and he doesn't. But uh, right. just uh, the, the, the very short answer, Mike, is yes, and stay tuned in two more weeks. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, let's see. Can the Axia Micro MPX be connected by a Mosley LAN link? There's no real reason, is there? I mean, it's well, within the bandwidth or constraints. Yeah, we focused on linear MPX first um, because, well, for one thing, that is probably, well, I wouldn't necessarily say the harder one, but uh, that's the one we wanted to focus on first. But we definitely have plans to look at micro MPX. Uh, right now, the linear P uh, MPX will be about three megabits, including the HD. Uh, once we go to micro MPX, we believe we can get it down to probably around 600 kilobits. Mm -hmm. uh, so that makes a big difference. The one thing that you do need to be aware of, the linear PCM will allow you to carry the 67 kilohertz SCA. Micro MPX will not. Other than sure. that, uh, you know, they're pretty much the same. All right. Um, one other, a couple other questions. Uh, uh, overcoming de delays in the open internet, like if you're VPN on one end and open internet on the other end, well, if you've got everything running through the same pipe, the delay all of a sudden becomes a non-issue, correct? Because the analog and digital are always delayed by exact same amount. So dither is no longer a factor either. Well, exactly, exactly. And that, that's really the key. It's a single pipe that carries both information. And then I don't care how, how long it takes. We could use a satellite link that takes 500 milliseconds um, mm -hmm. as long as we can carry it through. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the two will be locked. In, in right. our case, like I said, from Alex's off the garage, it's 39 milliseconds. And that's right. already orders of magnitude greater than what we're shooting for in our diversity delay. Now, is there any reason you couldn't use, you mentioned we were using TCP IP for this demo, any reason you couldn't use UDP for a one-way system like satellite delivery? Yeah, that's certainly possible. Uh, the TCP IP was convenient for starters. Uh, because it gives us a signal pipe and we don't have to wor worry about reordering um, or, or any of that. Uh, but I don't see any reason why we could not use sequence numbers uh, in a UDP system to, uh, to essentially accomplish the same. Um, again, sure. this is technology concept, those are all great things we're going to be starting to look at in the future, yes. And Butch Landry's asked what a fully redundant system would look like, but that also, I happen to know, will be covered quite nicely in the next webinar. So uh, the short answer is come back in two weeks, and uh, not only will we uh, tell you, we'll show you. Um, Kirk says, shut up and take my money. But uh, at that point, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll hand it back over to you, Phil. All right, very good. Well, I mean, this pretty much uh, concludes, uh, you know, the, the key points that I want to drive home today. Uh, you know, we've shown you that we've been able to time lock the FM and the HD1 uh, by synchronously splitting the audio and the audio processor, uh, coming up with a transmission scheme that handles both the E2X and MPX in a single IP stream, uh, and then by joining it together in a modulator that handles both the FM and the IBOC. Uh, the, the key thing with this is, and that again comes back to our question, can we centralize the entire HD radio chain, is that we're location agnostic. Um, we're no longer constrained to living at the transmitter site. Not to say that you could not put it there, or a backup system, or, 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 no, no issue with that, uh, but we're no longer required to be there. On, and uh, by doing so, we can either be at a transfer site or a studio, perhaps a centralized or regional studio that may not even be within the coverage area of your station. Um, the entire HD radio air chain is now entirely software-based, well, except for you know our, our transmitter, of course, and you know the, some of the exciter hardware below that. Uh, that, that certainly is hardware based. But we've shown you a concept where we no longer need purpose-built boxes. Uh, we're in a very flexible software-based environment. Uh, we've 
in this approach, we're, we're now moving away from audio cards or spe special hardware. Uh, there's no need for a reactive durability delay monitor. It's, I mean, it's still a good thing to have in, in your station. I'm not saying that, but you don't have to have it. Uh, and the same thing with GPS. It's still a good thing to have, but it is certainly not required to maintain a diversity delay. Um, it, uh, you know, all of these things, uh, you know, allow us now new options, new possibilities moving forward. Uh, Another, yo, know, go ahead. Say so that's really what it's all about is the flexibility. And uh, that's like somebody had asked, will this cost more or less, slightly less, slightly more than what we do now? And the short answer is it depends how you want to use it. Um, so it'll be very situational. In most cases, it'll be the same or less than the overall cost. So that's part of the benefit is is you reduce the number of pieces, you reduce the price point. Um, and I, exactly. It's the flexibility that you mentioned, Jeff, because uh, you know it really leads into custom tailored solutions uh, with the right. flexibility. You know, it's no longer here's your box, here's your inputs, here's your outputs, here's what it does live with it no uh we're, we're moving into an uh, into a uh you know, a new era where it is really built around you and your needs um right it will be very flexible and that ties into a question from william harrison whether you could use it to feed multiple sites simultaneously simultaneously and the answer in a nutshell is yes yes you could yeah no there's no issue with that as a matter of fact, one interesting use case of this uh, situation is now that the Omnion Enterprise 9S has micro MPX support, you could consider this for your main station, uh, have HD 1, 2, 3, and 4 running on that, uh, but then you could enable the micro MPX option in HD 2 and feed an FM translator with it, for example. Right. So it's not just HD, you know, it, it is, again, very flexible, very versatile. Yeah. And there's been a couple of questions on updating existing gear, and uh, my my inclination is if you get an HD multicast, it'd just be a software payload. But uh, what about if you've got an older importer exporter plus combination? Right. I mean, that's my last bullet point, and that, that's a very uh, important one. Certainly, you know, with our new gear, uh, we'll we'll make it very uh, easy and flexible to move forward. And you know, the HD multicast is certainly a corner piece for uh, uh, you know the, the near future. Um, so you know, new gear will we'll handle. Uh, but how do you deal with your 2005, 2006 vintage uh, exciter? And well, in that case, because we're using E2X, uh, which is the de facto standard for HD radio, we can still feed legacy transmitters like that. Uh, now, in that case, you would have to go back to a legacy mode, you know, UDP, TCP that only carries the HD. Uh, but it's still sort of possible as part of a fleet upgrade uh, to do that. Now, we could not guarantee our duration delay stability like we do in our new gear. Um, so you would also need a reactive duration delay correction monitor with that. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we're looking at solutions for that. And you'd, you'd also want an MPX node, a, a TELUS Alliance MPX node to handle the, uh, the FM component. Um, but we believe that with this, we can move forward the new equipment will just be much more easier plug and play, uh, but we can still handle the old, the legacy and 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 cross uh, compatibility issues as well. And somebody's asked that the Omnia can run on the the multicast, or would you need a separate computer for each process? And the short answer is no. There's uh, a lot of headroom to run multiple instances. I mean, in the one you're doing in your demo, I know when we're not running go to webinar on it. Uh, you're uh, you're drawing what about uh, under 20% of uh, hardware capacity, correct? I believe that's what it is. I mean, it depends on what features you turn on. Uh, you know, if you turn on the undo feature and things like that, it will it will change. But we have right now in this demo, all of what you've seen was processed on a single HD multicast. So that's uh, oh, and how does it handle a Xeon processor? Well, that, that's getting a little specific there. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, we are looking to, you know, I mean, compute, compute power is just exponentially increasing. Um, and the big thing is, you know, multi-core is becoming more and more available. Uh, and, uh, you know, so certainly we are looking for more modern processors for this application. Uh, but, you know, CPU power is, you know, it's getting cheaper, more easy, easily affordable. Um, so Alex right is... Uh pinging away in the background saying that it handles the Xeon just fine. So I'm sure he's uh, 
played with this once or <laughs> twice too. He probably uh, has. I have not. I, so what I, I haven't asked him is if he's run it on a Raspberry Pi yet, because I'm sure that uh, that that'll be coming as well. Um, <laughs> William Harrison just asked if you could quickly recap what the estimated bandwidth was for linear MPX plus the E2X. He knew you'd mentioned it, but he missed it. Yeah, it's about three megabits for the linear, and uh, most of that, of course, is the linear MPX. The HD only takes between 200, maybe 300 kilobits is what you want to provision for it. Uh, it. But if you drop it down to micro MPX, then you know the uh, 2.5 megabits, 2.6 megabits, whatever, um, will drop down to three, four, 500 is configurable kilobits. Okay, so if you were running the whole thing as uh, UDP over a satellite, what would you want to, uh, how many channels would you want to benchmark for that? Well, I, I don't know about channels. Um, you need to figure that one out. But uh, once we once we have in, included micro MPX, we're looking at about 600 kilobits. Okay, um, so that's about, uh, you, you're trying to do math in my head is a terrible idea, but four channels roughly at 160 kilobits per. So yes, that was correct. another yeah. question. Okay, well, that was uh, pretty much it, I think, for the, the bulk of stuff. So, uh, Philip, I want to thank you very, very much. If you want to flick to the next slide, we will, uh, unless there's something else you needed to cover before we get going. No, this is just a, a promo to tune into our next webinar. And which let's, is, uh, there it is, September 10th, folks. Uh, be there or be square, as they used to say, but uh, we'll uh, do another demo and we'll cover some of the questions where I said stay tuned for two weeks from now. On that note, I want to thank you very, very much for spending your time, Jeff Stedman and uh, Philip and uh, John White as well. I want to thank you guys very much for uh, spending some time with us this afternoon. By all means, if there are any questions, reach out to any one of us and uh, let us know. We'll be happy to get that for you. And of course, there will be an archive version of this webinar on the website in a couple of days. So again, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Bye now.